Hi everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our fireside chat. Please do feel free to turn your cameras on. It'd be lovely to see you all. Aaron, thank you for joining all the way from, is it Atlanta you're in? So it must be quite early there. So, yes, yes. <laughs> um, so it's not it's not four thirty. <laughs> okay, so this fireside chat is to welcome you all to our global advisory partnership with NRISC and Dr. Kynan Robinson. So the reason that we're launching our global advisory is to assist our member schools to embrace the crisis and the changes that we're all facing at the moment. We want to offer some fresh tools and fresh approaches. We here at ECIS and also at UNRISC want to offer approaches where we can support you continuously. We want to reach out once we've done this work with you and then say, well, how are you? How's this journey going? We, Kynan and I both don't believe in silver bullet PD. Kynan also provides decades of experience. NRUSC and ECIS have many shared passions. We both believe in a student-centered approach and building networks and communities. Kynan's recent PhD research has been considered groundbreaking and an important contribution to the field of education. So welcome Kynan, and please do introduce yourself to our audience today. Thanks, Cam. I just got to preface this by saying it's 4.30 in the morning where I am. <laughs> so if I stumble over things, you know, just, just give us a little break here. Um, hey, it's really exciting to be with you guys. It's really exciting to talk to you, Cam. Cam and I are good, fr good friends. We've got to know each other quite well over the last six or seven months. And um, we, we have a lot in common, which is really exciting. So that's why the, one of the part, that's why, that's one of the reasons why the partnership is really exciting for us too because we have a, uh, both organizations have, have really strong shared values, which is, I think is really important in partnering. Um, my, a little bit about my background. Um, I started out many years ago now as a musician, actually, a musician and a music teacher. And I actually learned a lot about education from being a music teacher, mainly how to keep a no the noise level to some sort of minimum working noise level, which is hard when you're a music teacher. Um, but essentially when I was, what I learned uh, about being a music teacher was um, I shifted the whole program away from just teaching sort of rote learning um, notation to a, to a program that empowered the kids to, to become composers themselves. So demystifying the, the notion of the composer to, to giving the ability or say to kids, you can do it. You can, you can write music yourself. Um, and this was young kids, actually, like six, six year olds up until 12 year olds. So it was an elementary school situation. And what I found by doing that is if you just if you just believed in them and gave them the right tools and let them go and work and get let them create um, I, over that six year period, I had kids in the, in the like year seven level or the grade seven level that I was teaching at who are who could write in 45 minutes. Um, they could write a, a, a comp, an original composition. That, that involved <clears throat> two-part harmony, an A section and a B section, complex rhythms, et cetera, et cetera. And they were writing at a much more sophisticated level than the university students that I was lecturing to, which is really interesting. Why was that is because like we, all we had done is empower them and made them believe in themselves and given them the opportunities and tools to actually create and, and they, it was quite possible. So sort of looking at that student-centered learning piece. Um, from there, I sort of moved into the technology realm and became the head of technology. Um, what was interesting about that role is actually it started to move me into leadership, which is really quite important for us um, us to consider whether you're a teacher or uh, or um, you know whatever whatever place you're operating in the school. Taking on leadership responsibility is hugely important because it gives you perspective. It opens you up to the larger scale of things. Often with young teachers, I find, and I was one of these myself, we work at this level um, where we think we're brilliant and we think we know better than everybody. We think we know better than the leaders and why are they making this decision? That's a stupid decision. But once you get into leadership, you start to realize, ah, oh, there's all these other factors that I hadn't realized. And then it's a continual, continual rise up in leadership to sort of start seeing things on a systemic level is hugely important and one of the things that we work at. If you go influence and make change, um, being able to see systemically is, is hugely important. Um, from that position in leadership and technology, I moved away from tech for tech's sake. So like, let's just buy loads of computers and let's just tech the school out. Um, which is really common back then. And I actually, I actually stopped that and, and moved into like, what is digital pedagogy? What is it? And how is it, how is it changing 
um, the way we learn and teach. And if it's not changing it, then let's just not do it. So for a tech, for a head of tech, that was kind of a controversial thing. Like, yeah, um, I, I would actually say, say that if, if it's not learning, stop buying this tech and let's stop doing this at technology conferences. But what I was essentially saying is technology has allowed us, um, is actually changing the way we learn. And what, what, it's, what it's doing for us is it's revealing um, that we learn collectively. Not, what is knowledge? Knowledge is not something that I hold in me. Knowledge is something that resides in networks. It resides in relationships. So how might we better connect to each other to, to collectively co-create new knowledge? That all exists on the internet, essentially. That's the great metaphor for that kind of thinking. Um, as students, we have the ability with technology to allow our students to become co-creators of new knowledge. So not just consumers of information, but co-creators of new knowledge. Why aren't we doing that in schools? So I took that position and, um, you know, we, when you start taking that position, essentially as, as I moved into senior leadership in the, in the school and in that school, we changed everything. We really went for it. We really experimented. We tried all sorts of things, um, really innovative practices, some that didn't work, some that didn't work, but we actually just, just had a go at it and we learned an awful lot. And we had, you know, we, we became a sort of a lighthouse school in Australia where teachers were flooding to see what we were doing. We had a lot of media coming. We had a lot of um, overseas kind of uh, education groups come and visit us to see what we were doing and then we had a lot of research happening with us so we had many universities looking at our practices and what we we're trying to achieve um, and, and partnering with us through one of the partnerships in the, with one of the universities I managed to uh, convince them that yes you can partner if I get my PhD out of this and so my PhD research essentially was work went into looking at creativity what is, what is creativity? Is it important in schools? Is it not important? I mean, we all talk about it. So what actually is it? I shifted the creativity from being something that we do as individuals to something that is always done collectively. It's not an individual trait. It doesn't reside in a person. It's not something I can teach you. The only thing we can do is we can get you to connect, learn how to connect better with others because together we create ideas. Ideas never come from a singular person. They come from, they always come from a collective. Um, and so in that, understanding that kind of theory, um, I then sort of looked at a school like um, traditional schooling and what is it in traditional schooling that either hinders or uh, enables collective creativity, cre creativity to exist. When you look at creativity from that kind of perspective, essentially what you're doing is you're drawing from a theory called complexity theory. Complexity theory says that complex adapting systems, um, when, they, when the right feature sets are involved, what this, this magic happens where things emerge from the system, emergent phenomenon it is called. Emergent phenomenon is a phenomenon that arises that has never been seen before. And it cannot be predicted by looking at any of the data in the individual agents. When, so so it, it's almost like a magic, it, it's, it happens when people come together, then emergent phenomenon exists. Um, so like the, uh, the internet is a great example of emergent phenomenon or any kind of new progression is emergent phenomenon. Schools are complex adapting systems. And so what are the, the factors in a school that, that enable or hinder this? So for emergent phenomenon to rise, collective creativity to really arise, um, there, there are the factors include non-hierarchy. Hierarchy is one of the things that kills it every single time. That's, that's a key killer. So what in schools are hierarchical? The way our leadership systems are set up, the way our curriculum, you know, this, schools are essentially completely hierarchical. How might we change that to being a non-hierarchical situation? So that's even talking about identity, the identity of teachers and students, very hierarchical. What does that actually do? How do we shift that to, a, to an environment called of, of co-learning and in the co-learning environment, what happens then? So essentially what we found in that PhD was that there's also, sorry, there's also other factors like um, the right amount of order and disorder. So you can think, well, I'm talking here about shifting to a much more student-centered approach. And a lot of teachers fear that because they think it's gonna go into chaos. It's not gonna go into chaos. It should have disorder. So your classroom should be a bit more of a mess, but not slipping into chaos. If it slips into chaos, it dies. If it has too much order, it also dies. So 
where I'm getting at with this is I then took that PhD, that PhD learning and all the learnings that I'd done in, as, a, as a leader and a sort of national leader in education in Australia and moved into, um, into consulting, uh, which is where we are now with NRUSC. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I'm sure we'll all look at uh, emergence phenomena straight after this to see yeah. how we feel. <laughs> I was wondering if I was there or not. I went there. So, Kynan, can you tell us a little bit about what you'll be able to provide for our schools through the partnership we've created with advisory? And what is it that you offer? And I know this always makes you laugh. What is it that NRS can offer that no others can? What is the thing that you bring? Yeah, <laughs> great question, Kim. Um, yeah, so for the advisory, the way we put the advisory together was, was um, like a really wonderful experience. It was really collaborative and co-created. So you can obviously tell from the way I'm speaking that co-creation is what I believe in, right? And that, so that goes all the way from classrooms all the way up to the, the whole school environment. How might we how might we learn to listen to each other better? How might we learn to actually have empathy for each other so that we can co-create together? Um, the advisory, um, ECIS and ourselves co-created it, which is, which is how I always like to work. Rather than me coming in and saying, hey, Cam, here's, here's what we're going to offer. Take it or leave it. You know, that's, that's not, not, not a, um, a position that really res respects well, CAM and ECIS's perspective and, and knowledge, and also also the knowledge of, um, of all the schools in the ECI membership. So the, we co-created it with ECIS. We co-created it by going out to a lot of heads of schools in, in the ECIS membership base and asking them, what are your greatest needs? What are your greatest wants? What's your greatest ambitions? What really drives you? And from that, we then created a, um, a number of services. Um, they include... Um, the first one is, is hugely important. It's about um, schools finding their own values. So this is a, this is a service that uh, most most schools out there will have some sort of value. Most of them are tied to like just you know nonsense like uh, values of respect and values of excellence and learning. The, we, we we would call these truisms. Like you should have that anyway. That is what every school should be about. So what else have you got that makes your school unique, special, different? Okay, so different in terms of it will be different because you're, where you exist, the community that you exist in is different from every other school's community. So, so in that, can you articulate for me um, the four or five key pillars that, um, that, you, that your, your community actually values? So the value should come from top down, uh, top up, not top down again, so non-hierarchical, involving everybody. Uh, and in that... Your values operate actually essentially as your North Stars or your, your guides or your behavioral compasses. And so um, when, you, when you get good values that everyone can understand and everyone can buy into, it shifts the whole culture of the schools because it's, it's, um, it's now a place where, like a place where you can run all your decisions through. So any decision that you make as a school, whether that be like hiring, firing, financial, all the way down to, like, or not down, all the way to like a, a beginner teacher wondering how might, what am I meant to do today? Do I do a worksheet or do I choose something else? Running those through your values and it also to student decisions as well of how might I behave in the classroom, how might I choose to do my study or react to teachers, etc. All of those behaviours will be shaped by your values and they should be, your decisions should always run through them. Companies that have very strong values are generally the companies that survive and thrive because they they know how to make a decision okay they're not just randomly making decisions they know how to make a decision because they run them through their values and go you know what uh, that would be a great idea if we parted with mcdonald's or whoever but like um, our values are saying like that that's not where that's not who we are about and so it 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 makes the decision for them or it guides them in the decision. So what, that, what does that do for you? It gives you a great culture. You know who you are. You can then tell that culture to the world and it's your own unique story. So you can tell that to the world and, then, and you can also tell that story to yourself. So you market externally and you market internally. We market externally, obviously, to put out with pride, hey, we know who we are. That's going to help you with your hiring and firing. It's going to help you with a whole bunch of stuff because people will look at your website and now go, wow, I, I fully get what this school's all about. It's not just a school. I fully understand what they believe. I want to work there. Um, 
and it helps you with your internal um, uh, internal I mean you tell the story to yourself internally because um, it, that's how you change your culture essentially so that's the first piece the second thing is we we looked at um, strategy and agile approaches to strategy um, which is quite different to the traditional way of doing strategy we do a lot of curriculum design and pedagogy work um, part of the um, the advisory is um, you know you're looking at your own unique value proposition which is slightly different what as you, what what do you do as a school that is unique to you and that you could potentially turn into a secondary revenue stream um, and then and then we do a lot of work on leadership and then the last piece of the advisory is um, uh, what's called the entrepreneurial school which is where I've partnered with uh, Chad Chu who is one of the world leaders in um, in mergers and acquisitions and so he had, he has a very different take on mergers and acquisitions uh, he, he, he he looks at what is of benefit when schools come together rather than um, potentially struggling by themselves? There's some of the things. Yeah, thank you. And part of the work that Kynan and I've discussed around the values and visions is about talking the talk and walking the walk. So if somebody comes in, they shouldn't just read the values and visions, they should be able to see them at play. And also as leaders, again, the hierarchy spoils certain things. What you want your team to do as a leader is you want them to follow you because they also believe in that value and vision, not because you've told them to. I think we've discussed that quite a lot, haven't we, Kynan? We have. About the horizontal leadership and how we want to take yeah. everyone with us because, you know, we've told them to come. Um, do you want, uh, let me just jump into the horizontal leadership stuff because okay. you also did ask, um, um, can you see my screen, Cam? We can see your screen. Thank you. Yeah, you also asked what's what's our differentiator. This is our differentiator, and these are our values and Rusk's values: connect, uh, learn, create, and change. So connect, learn, and create, and change. They feel like they appear as four buzzwords, right? Oh, everybody's got something similar to that. But the way we view them is quite different. So the way we we um, you can you can obviously tell from the way I was talking uh, about um, complexity theory before. Connection is hugely important to us. We learn best when we connect. So how might we help schools connect internally with each other, but then also connect externally? And so that's also part of the advisory. Our advisory, uh, the values that ECIS have in regards to how we learn, it's very close to ours. We learn best together. And so, um, so through setting up systems of coaching, setting up systems of, of full support, et cetera, um, that's really, really important to us. We connect to learn. So again, learn learning is tied to connection in terms of that's how we learn best. Establishing cultures of learning uh, in organisations is hugely important. It's especially important in the work that we do in, in the corporate or startup world, helping them move away from like cultures of learning that are just top down. The boss just tells you how it is and that's how it is to setting up environments where we learn from each other. So which is the same principles that can be applied all the way to a school, all the way to a classroom. We, are, we don't advocate the teacher at the front of the class as an expert telling kind of model. We advocate a learn, a listening to learn. So the co-learner environment, we do that to create because again, through connection and learning, that's how we create. That's what creativity actually is. And why do we create? We create to change. Okay, so you, these appear as separate things, but they're actually deeply interwoven and they all affect each other. Change is hugely important to our organisation. We are passionate about it. We believe in it. In fact, it's one of the few things we do believe in. Um, and, and when I say that, um, for schools, this is a difficult one. Why do we need to change? Change is not a negative. Change is actually the best thing you can do because it's about life. Life is about continual change and evolution. Education is about continual change and, and evolution. It is not about doing the same things you did 12 months ago, six months ago, two days ago, yesterday. Okay, it's, it's this, this the notion of continually looking at ourselves. How might we continually look at ourselves, have empathy for ourselves as individuals and organizations? And how might we find problems in ourselves? We find problems. Uh, so that we can change them. That's so problem finding being a good good thing, change being a great thing. So I always try and flip the change thing is like, this is the most exciting thing we can do, but then you do need to help organizations through that. Um, given that we then move into, um, let me 
jump onto this next slide. This is key to us, which is kind of different to most or most other consulting companies. AA, which is not Alcoholics Anonymous, it's Agile Approaches. So Agile Approaches, what are they and how are they applied? To, how, how do they apply to schools? Um, this, this slide specifically relates to strategy. So shifting the way we do strategy from a, from a waterfall method to a to an agile method. So the old ways essentially looked at five year plans. So they would lock you into a five year plan and you've got five years to deliver that. So, so you're locked in for five years, despite the fact that everything around you is changing, all right? So it's kind of nonsense. They're really about imposition from on high, like traditionally, like the board would come up with the strategic plan and then just tell you what to do, which really like seeing people as, um, um, at, so shifting, so the new way would shift them to see them as um, outcomes, not output based. Whereas this one is like, it doesn't involve everybody. So how do you get buy-in? How do you get, you know, all of that sort of stuff? It's just a, it's just a telling kind of approach. Um, the old ways have little room for input from everyone, which is hugely important. We are all involved in the strategic process. We're in, all involved in the, in the school. We all, collectively, we create together. So the old way we're like the, two, the three or four people up here doing it, that's not about collective creativity. That's about a telling approach. Death by committee, so having committees like do all the work. Again, siloed, isolated, not, not enabling a whole bunch of creativity, not really enabling much input from other people. Um, they're really about risk mitigation <clears throat> all the time. Risk mitigation, risk mitigation. If you overdo it with risk mitigation, you don't create anything. You don't, you don't create the environment where the, the ability to fail is actually a great thing. So we, we, are, we are concerned with risk, but we're not about risk mitigation all the time. It's not our, our biggest focus. They're incomplete, quite often incomplete um, in terms of only 20 to 30% of strategic plans ever get completed. Um, so that's fairly inefficient and fairly ineffectual. Um, they're quite boring as well. The new ways, they empower the new ways of looking at things. Sorry, Sarah, do <laughs> you agree with me? <laughs> the new ways of looking at things. And so this can apply to strategy, but can I, it applies to all of our, into our entire approach. It's the mindset that we believe in that we're trying to show schools how to have. Uh, it, they empower rather than control, okay? And I know this is ECI, ECI says values as well, to empower you. If you look at ECIS as middle leadership course, uh, it's, a, it's a course, where we, we just don't have a consultant coming in telling you how to do middle leadership. It's a course that's built from the ground up. So, uh, I mean, Cam, do you want to chat, chat to that, that point a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So empower others rather than control. So our middle leader course is run by middle leaders. The facilitators are exceptional educators who you can say to them, so what happened when you used to teach maths and then you became head of maths? So it's not a theory based course, it's doing that co-creation. And our facilitators often say that they've learned things on every course that they've run as well. And it's really interesting what you just said as well, Kynan, about the previous slide, that only 20 to 30% of strategic plans get completed. And part of that is if you call somebody in and they're with you for a week to work on your strategic plan, and then they leave you with lots of notes and post-it notes. And then when you're looking at it another week down the road, you think, well, what was that point? And that's something we want to move away from, isn't it, Kynan? We want them to know exactly what they need to do before we leave. And if we had a five-year plan now, I mean, two years into it, COVID would have happened. Um, <laughs> and, you know, and we've all fallen off the cliff into a completely different world. Um, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So that, and COVID has really, I mean, these, these, these problems always existed in schools, but COVID has really shone the light on a lot of this sort of stuff or just accentuated it, which is why schools are really ready to hear this sort of stuff because it called them, it like, didn't call them out, but, you know, it, it, it positioned them in a very difficult position in terms of they weren't able to pivot fast enough. Why were they not able to pivot fast enough? Because the, the whole structure is set up for risk mitigation or it's set up in, the, in that old, old kind of way of doing it rather than this way. Well, when you empower rather than control too, what you do is you involve the whole community. So you listen, you get, you develop empathy, empathy for not only for yourself to understand what's stopping you from listening, but then that allows empathy for other. 
empathy when you have empathy when you have empathy for self for empathy for the other it allows the other person to do exactly the same and that then st starts to create what i call the space to be which is the space to be between two people where real creativity can actually happen how can you do that on scale what happens when you do that on scale essentially you get much more creative ideas you get much more buy-in you get you get much more achieved um, and you create a culture of pride so decision making is distributed values uh, are like the new way is value self-organization and fluidity in teams, which is something really interesting for schools to consider. Most, many schools are siloed, highly, highly siloed. What happens when you silo and what are you not enabling when you're siloing? What happens when you have fluidity of teams? So people being able to move quickly between one team and another, it increases the creativity, it increases the innovation. Um, it also values a continual testing and iteration kind of process. So always looking at the things that you do continually I'm trying to find the assumptions that whatever you do holds and test it to see if it's working. So not assuming, oh, we've just got a great system. If you assume that, that's when you're starting to move into stasis, okay? <laughs> but if you go into the, um, a mindset of continually testing and iteration, um, essentially you are always trying to get better, which is one of the key things that I know Cam also believes in, which is the idea of continuous development. And there's that, there's that change notion again, isn't it? We, we don't just accept what we are. We are always looking to change because that's life. We're connecting with life better when we are continually testing and iterating whatever we do to change. Um, it's collectively created. It has a focus on innovation and change. The chances of surviving and success are exceptionally high. And this is coming from, from a lot of research. It's deeply empathetic, the new ways, and creates a culture of pride. Uh, the deeply empathetic piece is really interesting in regards to... Um, because I know a lot of schools talk about empathy, but what really is empathy? One of the schools that we're working with um, over here in the, in the States, uh, who was a highly, highly successful school, one of the top schools in, in America, a public school, and it, um, it still had the courage to bring us in and go, um, how can we change? How can we innovate? So they're not settling on, we are the number one school. They're still wanting to get better, not for the ranking, but for themselves and for their students. And so from a lot of the work that we did with them, we discovered that like, we discovered that there was connectivity problems essentially between teachers and students. Both, both sides valued that relationship and both sides thought, uh, the teachers thought they had a great relationship with the students, but when you actually went and talked to the students, the students actually essentially were always in fear of the teachers. They were highly stressed, they were highly anxious. They wanted the teachers to like them, but thought that they hated them. So it was like a very, it was hugely revealing for a lot of the teachers. And so, um, um, so through that work, we started to develop sort of like processes and workshops where everyone could listen better to each other. And when we did that, especially coming out of COVID, when we did that, what we realized, but both, both sides realized um, different things about the other. The, te the teachers had the ability to say, I've really been struggling through this COVID period. I've re like, you know, just be honest and like, show some vulnerability. I've really been struggling. I'm trying my best. Sometimes I just know I'm hopeless and, and, and I'm not doing a great job, but I'm really trying. And then the students hearing that could say, oh, that's so weird. We thought we were the ones who were really struggling and you thought we were useless. And so once you get that position of, of, of empathy, together they have now joined to, to create new processes to overcome that kind of feeling. So that's, and that school now wants to be called, wants to be known as the listening school, which is really interesting to me. Yeah, that's fabulous. And also having that sort of empathy creates compassion, which is exactly what's needed for everyone to understand fully. So the teachers showing their vulnerability, so the students don't always feel that hierarchical thing. That's that's really good. Yeah. So we've talked a little bit about the process, and obviously, when you go into schools, you want everyone to be involved. It's not just um, a workshop that you do with leaders and then they tell everyone. So you already have the buy-in for the work that you're doing. So talk to us a little bit about the collaboration and the future focus, because you know. I want our schools then to be able to come back to you and say, Kynan, you know, we talked about that three months ago. We didn't quite get that bit. How can we make that work better? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, and this this actually, again, ties to um, Cam's middle leadership course, how, how they run that course. Um, where we, we, When we work with a school, like one of, the, one of the things I say is you pay the money, you do the work, <laughs> which is counter to what most consultants would say. But essentially what you're saying there is, 
we will come in and commit to you. Like we'll commit to you as an organization. And when I say commit, it's like we, we're part of it. We believe in you. We, we get to know you, you get to know us and we're part of your team. Um, in that, we will help you put, put teams together, design teams together that represent, <clears throat> excuse me, all those stakeholders. So the design teams that have leadership, board members, teachers, students, parents, whatever. Um, we help them create a non-hierarchical situation or a space of vulnerability where very quickly things can come out. And when things can come out, like problems can come out, quite often, like, again, like the teachers will hear the parents, they'll actually hear them clearly for the first time rather than fearing them. We're all a part of this together. And when individual problems come out and you unite them, a really big complex problem then starts to emerge, which is great. It's fantastic. Once that starts to emerge, we can collectively, and then that group, what we do essentially with that group is we, we, we immerse them into themselves and then we teach them how to do it. So they go out to the rest of the school and involve the rest of the school, immerse the rest of the school, essentially creating huge, huge amounts of data. Once you've done that, um, you, you ideate and you prototype solutions through. That's to, so how, how, how do you design very innovative solutions? Through prototyping, essentially. Um, what, what, you know, that can take a bit of a process, but what essentially that's doing is um, we are, we are coming in not telling them what their problems are and not telling them how, how to find the solution, but we're helping them discover it for themselves and then design their own solutions for themselves. That's always so much more powerful than how most consultants come in and, and basically say, hey, we'll do all the data gathering for you. We'll go analyze it. We'll give you a solution and we'll leave and then that'll get thrown in the cupboard. Um, this way, like it, that it involves and believes in everybody, um, actually achieves success because people are personally invested, schools are personally invested. When it comes to like the longer term stuff that you were talking about, Cam, like, you know, it's hugely important. So moving away from that run and gun kind of consulting approach to like, we're, we're with you to the end. What is our role? Our role is to guide you. Our role is to teach you actually, to teach you processes and tools. Our role is to ensure that whatever we say we want to achieve actually gets achieved. And so, um, so not just leaving you alone once you know the job's done, but always connecting back and finding ways to um, to keep assisting you or passing you to ECIS's team so that they can assist you or whatever it is. Thank you. We've actually got one of our wonderful middle leader course facilitators just joined us, superstar Nancy. So <laughs> you may have heard that we've been talking a little bit about the middle leader courses, Nancy. And I know that you've been running them, is it for five or six years now? Uh, I think I started the first one in 2014 or 15. So it's like, yeah, five years, at least five years. Yeah. yeah. And we started and in London. Have, and you still have middle leaders that reach out to you, don't they, Nancy? I do. From that time, it was a wonderful experience. It was with the uh, American School in London. And, you know, it was just maintaining those relationships over the years. And they were just such wonderful people. Like, it, it was just a really nice um, connection. It was great dialogue and it was a privilege. I absolutely loved it that I'm still able to have these connections after so many years. Thank you, Nancy. And Nancy is one of those people that works with ECIS, again, with that mission of collaboration and continuous con connection. So you won't just see Nancy for a day or two. She'll just pop up all the time once you've been to a middle leader course. <laughs> oh, she pops up all the time. <laughs> <laughs> You know what, Cam, what's nice about it is that new mentorship program, you know, that you're, that you're maintaining to keep those connections as well, which has been really well received. Yeah, and we've already had lots of mentoring meetings and before um, Kynan and I started the call, um, somebody's actually been offered a job that, you know, we've been mentoring. So it's actually making the changes that we want to create in the world. So before we finish off, um, I'm going to hand over to Kynan to say anything he needs to, but we will be <laughs> launching a leadership retreat in August, and that will be to come together and to share what's happened and to refocus and re-energize ready for the new term. And we're really grateful that you all joined us and connected today. Kynan, I'll let you finish off. Five minutes, Kynan. Five minutes? <laughs> I could talk for hours. I see one here. <laughs> um, five minutes. 
Yeah. Well, actually, let's throw out open to like Nancy or Sarah or, or anyone in the audience. Is there any questions or any um, any insights that you want to add based on some of the stuff, the way that Kevin and I have been talking, like experiences that you've had? Since you ask, <laughs> <laughs> I've got a question for you. Um, I, I, I just found it really exciting to hear the way that you've um, uh, given us a story here again, and um, um, a, 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 and a journey that we can follow. And I'm just interested in what your thoughts are about why we as um, organizations as schools where we believe that we are empowering others we believe that we're enabling and ennobling um, each other and the children um, and and yet we have this resilience to check or this resistance to change so often and and what you think where do you think that comes from and um, um, you know why do we fall into that trap of of creating barriers for ourselves and um, and and um, Feeling more comfortable with our fears than 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 we do with the um, prospective journey. That is a great question. I could talk for ten hours on this. Do you want me to? Uh, <laughs> but let's talk together, Sarah. Like um, the resistance to change doesn't come from like people being bad or schools being bad, or it doesn't come from like it, it's it's. It, like that's not what creates it. It actually is created by the discourse that we exist in. That's actually like our mindset or our worldviews. And so our current worldviews, <laughs> how theoretical do you want me to get? Our current worldview is based on reductionism. Reductionism looks for absolute truth or answers. That's the truth. And, and there it is. We found the answer to life. There it is. And so when you, when you have that kind of thought process or worldview or mind view, it actually leads you to going, I know the answer. I know the answer. Stop. I don't need to do any more of it. Like when you shift to this other worldview, which is like coming from complexity. And so that's re reflected in a lot of the way that industry now works. So like all that stuff that I talked about, like non-hierarchy, et cetera, et cetera. These are approaches that industry is, is creating uh, uh, for themselves in terms of how might, we, how might we better develop software? How might we you know, better develop products that actually mean something to the market? How might we listen to our users rather than just assuming we know? Um, when you shift that kind of mindset, that's where change is seen as a total positive because it's linked to creativity. Why do we create and why do we, how do we create better? We create to test and iterate, test and iterate. So the iteration there is continual improvement, which is continual change. So that's what we can do it on ourselves, we can do it on our team, and we should be doing it school-wide. Um, and, and embracing that idea of change because everything is changing so rapidly. And I think the COVID situation has really brought that to light. It's like, oh, right, yeah, right. It is changing rapidly. And how might we contribute to that change? Or like, I think I put this in the tweet to you. One of the things we like to talk about is how might we tell the story and contribute to the change rather than the change just happening to us? Right. So if you avoid change, it's forced upon you and you get no say in it. If you embrace it, you can actually lead the change and lead the change um, for, for, for education worldwide. It's you know, totally possible. And, and our students can be... Say so that again, sorry. So that hierarchical um, um, traditional model is just feeding that fear of change, uh, whereas by opening up with a... Um, uh, everybody contributing, um, there's no need for that fear because- we No all... need for the fear at all because it's not on you. It's on all of us. And we all do it together because we love doing it. So like, if it's it's never on you because we like, that's just not how the world functions. Like ideas don't come from just me. It's on all of us. So that goes into how we set up our leadership. The leadership should be distributed because we all have equal say in it. Um, hey, your point about storytelling, which I also really like. Storytelling is hugely important. It's like, um, um, we, we, because if we say these things about ourselves, like, as you just said, we all believe that we're empowering. We all believe. That it's like, I'll say to you, can you go and find and tell me the stories that can be used as evidence for what you just said? Um, and if you can't, that's a great thing, because now you need to tell those stories to yourself to make that happen. And if you can, that's also a great thing because it helps people conceptualize the abstract. We empower students. I have no idea what that means. What's the story that you can tell 
that to, get, to me of, of evidence of that existing. Like, what do you mean by that? Telling me the story helps me understand and go, oh, wow, that's awesome. I want to be a part of that. But it also helps us together go, that's a good story, but it can get better if we test this, 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 and change those, those components. We also, like, the way we view storytelling and the way can view storytelling is a little bit different to the rest of the world. We should find our own unique stories to, tell, to shout them at the world. No. What about if we helped each other find, help each other find and tell <clears throat> each other's stories and then our collective stories? How much more powerful would that be? Absolutely. And also moving from that vertical um, model of management to a horizontal management system really helps. And change is here to stay. You know, what has happened with COVID and what's happening in our schools, change will keep happening. And the sooner we embrace it, the, the better it is. And, it, and again, being lifelong learners helps us with that change because we're always learning new things and changing what we're doing. And the yeah. other thing I just wanted to finish with as well, stories are really powerful as well because they give everyone a vision of where you've come from. So they all think they can do it because you've come from yeah. this, where you're going and what your values are. So it's really powerful for that as well, for people to understand who, who you are. So do we yeah. have any more questions in the chat box before we finish up for today? Thank you so much for joining us. Really. It's all right, Kyle, and I've got it. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. And um, we look forward to connecting with you again in the future. Take care. Please stay safe, everybody. Bye. Thanks, guys. Love to see you all.